to accompany uh, the distribution of that uh, token of our appreciation to all the moms. I do, I typically read this uh, every Mother's Day, and it's not original to me. To those who gave birth this year to their first child, we celebrate with you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, tears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with their children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through test drive, driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, forgive us if we seem insensitive. We acknowledge that life has not turned out the way you long for it to be, and we are here to listen and not judge. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on those complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we want you to know that your love is not lost on us. We need you. To those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year, we're here for you to lean on as you go through this transition. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness and remember how you hold that child in your heart. To those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you, and we honor you. If you will turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 4, as we begin our lesson, I want us to read verses 21 through 31. <clears throat> Galatians 4, beginning in verse 21, hear now the word of the true and living God. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law. Do you not listen to the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These, two, these women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children of slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Let us pray. Father, give us Holy Spirit wisdom 
this morning as we consider these things. As we consider who is our mother, we pray that as we, your children, gather around your word, you would give us clear insight into that. We pray all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Galatians 4, verses 21 through 31, comes at the end of an extended argument that the Apostle Paul is making in the book of Galatians as he defends the gospel of justification by faith in Christ. Paul has made five arguments as you work your way through this book, beginning in chapter 3 all the way here to the end of chapter 4. Back in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 3, he appealed to the Galatians' own experience, even Verse 2 really bears this out. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? So it's a very personal argument that he's making about the Galatians' own experience. And then beginning in verse 6 through 25 of chapter 3, Paul brings Scripture to the table, especially here verse 11 of chapter 3. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the just shall live by faith. That's Habakkuk chapter 2. Righteousness is by faith, and he brings the testimony of the Old Testament to bear on this question. This is the scriptural argument. And then, beginning in verse 26, running into chapter 4 and verse 7, He talks about how one becomes a son of God, how one becomes an heir of God, especially verse 29 of chapter 3. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Picking up in chapter 4, verses 8 through 20, Paul appeals to his relationship with the Galatians. Verse 11, he says, I'm afraid... I, have la- I may have labored over you in vain. And then the verse right before our text, I wish I could be present with you now and change my tone. I'm perplexed about you. He even leaned into the imagery of motherhood in verse 19. For verse 19, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And so all of these strain, all these strands come together in verses 21 through 20 through 31 of chapter 4 as Paul seeks to land the plane here using an allegorical interpretation of the Hagar Sarah situation. This is intended to drive home the point found in 5 and verse 1 of Galatians for freedom Christ has set us free stand firm therefore And do not subject yourself again to a yoke of slavery. See, God has set us free in Christ. And it's for freedom that we might obey Him. Freedom to be all that God would have us to be. Not freedom to do whatever we want, all the the income free. Hey, I said a prayer, I shook a hand, I walked an aisle, and I'm good now. And I just kind of wash my hands, I can just drip dry in the pew, as it were, after my baptism. Now, there's so much more to the Christian life, seeing as how God has set us free in Christ. It is this tale of two mothers that Paul, again, concludes this extended argument he's been making. The story begins back in Genesis chapter 16. Keep your finger there in Galatians. We're going to come back here in just a few minutes. But in Genesis chapter 16... You have the story of these two women, Sarai, her name has not yet been changed to Sarah, but it will be, Sarai and her maidservant, her slave, Hagar, and you know, it was was Sarai's idea in the first place. Abram, she tells her husband, take my servant, take my slave, Hagar. It may be, verse 2, Genesis 16, 2, it may be, perhaps, that I shall obtain children by her. It was a bad idea. It was a faithless idea. It demonstrates a principle that I think is true across time and space, that great mothers have great problems. 
Sarah, she's going to be a great mother. She's going to give birth to this child of promise, to Isaac, one day. But she's got a great problem in that the story begins with her failing to believe the promise of God. Now, it's been about a decade since Abram received that promise from God. And, you know, maybe, just maybe, we need to rely upon that old philosophy that God helps those who help themselves. And that's the thing, is, is Ishmael, this child that will come from Abram and Hagar, Ishmael is the living embodiment of just how erroneous that philosophy is. It's not that God helps those who help themselves. God helps the helpless. And so, with this comes problems. Again, great problems. There's trouble in Abram's house with Hagar and Sarai. And, but as we fast forward into chapter 17, and you pick up in verse 15, this goes all the way into chapter 18, you have once again the promise that is given to Abraham as Sarah is in earshot. She can overhear the conversation that God is having with Abraham, and, and God promises Isaac to Abraham. Sarah's reaction to this conversation, she laughs. She laughs at the promise of God, and it is a laugh in unbelief, and I believe we can demonstrate that from what happens when God calls her on the carpet for laughing in uh, chapter 18 and verse 15. Sarah denied it. You laughed. Why did you laugh? God asked Sarah. I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. Mm, got her. And again, it's a laugh in unbelief. Again, great mothers have great problems. The story culminates in chapter 21 of Genesis with the birth of Isaac. Isaac is born. Sarah gives birth to the child of promise. That long-awaited child took about a quarter of a century to finally come to fulfillment. And guess what? Ishmael does what Sarah did all those years ago when she heard the promise of God. He laughs. And like God, Sarah didn't like it when Ishmael laughed. And that's why you have in verse 10, Sarah says to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. Not exactly a compassionate or gracious response. Again, great mothers have great problems. If that weren't true, you wouldn't need a Savior. But that's why we do need a Savior. That's why Sarah needs a Savior. That's why you, Mom, need a Savior. This is the background history for what Paul argues now, what he interprets allegorically in Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 through 31. Again, there's a lot more to the story. We kind of did some shorthand here, but I believe we have the information that is necessary to make sense of what Paul is saying here. We know a bit more about Sarah and Hagar and the whole situation that developed between Isaac and Ishmael. One, as Paul calls him, the son of promise. The other, son of the flesh. The major concepts that are derived from this account here focus on two key themes. One is freedom, and the other is slavery. Sarah was a free woman. She gave birth to the child of promise. Hagar was the slave woman who gave birth to the child of slavery. Paul, verse 24 of Galatians 4, tells us, Paul interprets this allegorically, and he speaks of the struggle that is going on within the Galatian churches. And it boils down to this, will you be free in Christ, or will you be subject to bondage to the law? Your choice. Are you going to be Hagar's kids, or are you going to be Sarah's children? Now, admittedly, Sarah is not specifically mentioned in this text, but given the mention of Hagar... And given the mention of Isaac, it seems that the contrast there is evident. 
But even here, it's not that the, the two women represent women as such, but what does Paul say here in verse 24? These women are two covenants. And that's, that's the divide here. Two covenants are in play. Hagar is representative of the covenant from Mount Sinai. He says, verse 25, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Paul had spent some time in Arabia. He knows whereof he speaks here. And really, Mount Sinai, when you think of Mount Sinai, it's supposed to conjure up the law. The law demanded perfect obedience if you would have right standing with God. On the other hand is the covenant of promise, which again is represented by Sarah here. And involved in that covenant of promise is redemption in Christ and reception of the Holy Spirit. Back in Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14, Paul has already accentuated this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised Spirit through faith. You hear it, don't you? That we have this covenant, covenant and we are members of that covenant by faith and by the Spirit. Paul goes on here. Not only is Hagar representative of Mount Sinai, she's also the present Jerusalem. This is in contrast with the Jerusalem that is from above, which Sarah represents. Hagar, her children are children of the slave woman, like Ishmael. Sarah, her children are children of promise, like Isaac. Hagar's children, there's no share in the inheritance. Sarah... There's only the inheritance. And really it boils down in verse 29 to Hagar's children are unregenerate. They are born according to the flesh. Sarah's children are regenerate. They are born according to the Spirit. And so those, those are the, is how this shakes out here with this Again, allegorical interpretation of the Hagar-Sarah story. And again, what it boils down to is life. Will you stand in the covenant of life or not? And everything that that other covenant represents, which is death. It also comes down to the inheritance. Verse 30, what does the scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. Again, Paul is presenting a very strong contrast between these two covenants. And again, the Galatians, they've, they've got some work to do here. They've got a very critical decision to make. Are they going to stand in the line of Hagar? associated with Mount Sinai and slavery in the present Jerusalem and flesh? Or are they going to stand in the line of Sarah, who's associated with Mount Zion, with freedom, with the heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem from above, with the Spirit, with the promise? When it comes to that inheritance, God's riches are not inherited by keeping the law, but by believing in Christ. And I believe what bothers Paul the most about what the Galatians have done with the gospel is that they view law-keeping, at least from Paul's perspective here, the law-keeping of the Galatians is somehow their way of finishing what Christ appears to have left unfinished. That from Paul's perspective, again, what the Galatians have done, their law-keeping implies that Christ's death did not accomplish what Christ actually says it accomplishes. And that is a very serious thing. That's a very serious distortion of the gospel. You see here, there's a lot of two 
There are five sets of twos here, as far as I can tell. There are two mothers. There are two sons, two covenants, two mountains, Mount Sinai and seemingly Mount Zion on the other hand, two cities, the present Jerusalem and the Jerusalem from above. The heavenly Jerusalem, again, a fascinating concept here. The heavenly Jerusalem, as is said in verse 26, is free. She is our mother. And I don't, do not believe we're supposed to conflate here that heavenly Jerusalem with the church. But in fact, it's the heavenly Jerusalem that gives birth to the church. We pledge allegiance to a higher Jerusalem. A Jerusalem that is above, that is free. She is our mother. She is our mother. That includes Paul. Paul, Paul a Hebrew of Hebrews, includes himself in that. Now, I do believe we, we need to emphasize something here. So we don't run too far ahead of Paul or, or misunderstand what he is saying. Paul is not opposed to keeping the law as, in total, as such. Okay? If he were opposed to that, we need to, make, we need to figure out, what, well, then why does he keep quoting from the law? You know, he'll say things like, let he who stole steal no longer, which in back of that implies the law. One of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. Yeah. Or, you know, why when he's talking to children, he says, you need to honor your father and mother. Where do you get that? Oh, yeah, that's right. It's from the law. So it's not just keeping the law or obeying the truth, as he's going to describe it in Galatians chapter 5. It's not just keeping the law in itself, but there's a specific kind of law keeping that Paul views as antagonistic to the gospel. And that is the law keeping that the Galatians were all wrapped around. The, the kind of keeping the law that, again, view, you, you view yourself as finishing, finishing the work of Christ that he apparently has left unfinished. That you are keeping the law because you view the end of time as a time when you must stand before God and justify yourself based on your law keeping. And what Paul says is, no, 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 no. I don't want to be found with a righteousness of my own, and neither should you, because quite frankly, if you're going to become subject to the, whole, to, to the circumcision, you've got to be subject to the whole law, and everybody knows you cannot be justified by the law. He's already made that statement earlier in uh, Galatians. We saw that back in 3 and verse 11. It is evident. It's clear, it's obvious that no one is justified before God by the law. We don't have it within ourselves to keep the law perfectly, to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. Good thing is, and here's the good news, Christ did it for us. So then what is it that God calls us to? For, and again, this is the rest of verse 11. This is a quotation from Habakkuk, chapter 2. The just, the just person, the righteous person shall live by faith. We are called to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ as the only one who has fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. And therefore, what becomes of our law keeping? We, we're not trying to keep the law in order to somehow earn our way into heaven or gain a right standing with God. We've got that in Christ. We're as justified now as we'll ever be. But what we're doing when we seek to obey what God has given us, because again, the law, according to Paul, is good, holy, righteous, spiritual. That's our grateful response for what God has done for us in Christ. We are, to quote from Paul elsewhere, we are walking in good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk therein. That's what we're doing. And so we see God's involvement in this in a couple of different ways. Number one, 
You go back to the Sarah and Hagar situation. Even though that was the result of faithlessness and, and sin, not believing the promises of God, God providentially is still overseeing that and seeing to it that those things shake out the way that they do. Because, Paul, because God anticipates that one day, by His Spirit, He is going to move Paul in order to interpret that allegorically to help these Galatian Christians, and hopefully help us too, understand justification by faith and that glorious doctrine that's at the heart of the gospel. But then also, God's involvement is seen especially there in that we are born according to the Spirit. And, and it's the, the Jerusalem from above that is our mother. See, God's involvement in all of that is how He justifies us by His grace. How He justifies us by faith. That we are born of the Spirit. That we are redeemed in Christ. That we've received the Holy Spirit. That we are now heirs of that promise. That we have freedom. For freedom, Christ has set us free. There's the glorious truth. And so this, this is why Paul is so strong in what he's saying here. Oh, foolish Galatians, he calls them back at the beginning of chapter 3. You're going to go back to slavery when you've been set free from Christ? Uh, set free in Christ, I should say. And so again, it, it boils down to what will the Galatians choose? And really it comes ringing down to us. What will we choose? Will we pursue the present Jerusalem uh, of trying to somehow justify ourselves before God or anticipating that at the final day we'll stand before God and, and somehow we have done what He's required and, and will be justified then? Which is itself just a yoke of slavery? Or will we recognize we've been set free in Christ? That we have been justified in Christ? And that now we are seeking to live these lives pleasing to God and obeying the truth in order to show our gratitude for that freedom that we have. Just a brief story. There was a mother and at breakfast when she was clearing the table. When she picked up her plate, she found a, a note, and when she opened it up, it was a bill that her little son, Bobby, eight years old, had written. It said, Mother owes Bobby for running errands, 25 cents, for being good, 10 cents, for taking music lessons, 15 cents, for extras, 5 cents, a total of 55 cents. Well, the mother, she kind of smiled at the note and didn't say anything about it. Lunchtime came and Bobby came down to eat and he found a note tucked under his plate and he pulled it out and inside the note was the 55 cents that mother owed. But then the note had a bill of its own. And, he, and little Bobby read this, and he said, Bobby owes mother for nursing him through scarlet fever, nothing. For being good to him, nothing. For clothes, shoes, and playthings, nothing. For his playroom, nothing. For his meals, nothing. Total, nothing. In a similar way, Jerusalem from above, our mother, charges nothing. In the sense that we are not somehow finishing what Christ started by our keeping of the law. And we need not wait for some future date to prove that we are somehow approved by God because of our law keeping. God has graciously saved us in Christ. He has justified us completely. Christ is a perfect Savior saving us completely. Christ has finished the work of atonement, and we 
and he has sat down at the right hand of the Father. He's completed his work in that regard. And again, when we obey the truth and we do what the law says, it is our grateful response for what God has done in Christ by setting us free from bondage. Let's commit this to prayer. God, you are so good to us, and we know that there is no way that we could pay you back, but we know that because of Christ, you charge us nothing. And we are so grateful for that. For Christ taking our place on the cross and redeeming us from the curse, we give you thanks. For the Holy Spirit, whom we have received, helping us in our walk with Christ, we give you thanks. And we thank you for the Jerusalem above that is our mother. 